going to continue our series in the Lord's Prayer. And let me read our text to you one more time. These are the words of Jesus. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for this opportunity that we have to look at your word and to appropriate it to our lives. And Father, we realize that in order for that to happen, we need your Holy Spirit to speak to us and to move in us and to move in this time together. So we give you permission and freedom to speak to our hearts and our minds. For Lord, we are, we are listening and we are desiring, Lord, to say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I got a question for you. This is a very important question. Have you ever seen the movie, What About Bob? Have you ever seen that movie? It is hilarious, What About Bob? I know it's a little bit dated, and uh, the guys on here, uh, they're looking a lot younger in that photo than they did when they actually made the movie. But the story, it, it revolves around a character by the name of Bob Wiley, okay? And, and he's played by Bill Murray. And as the movie progresses, we discover that Bob has just about every psychosis known to man. He's got issues. Bob is so needy, he drove his former psychiatrist crazy. And so now Bob is on a hunt for a new one. Now, his new one is Dr. Leo Marvin, who is played by Richard Dreyfuss. Dr. Marvin, you have to understand, he's got more than a little bit of an elevated sense of ego about him, and he's written a new book called Baby Steps that he believes will take care of everybody's problems and issues. So Bob sees Dr. Martin as his savior, and Baby Steps as the answer to all his problems. And after their first session, Dr. Marvin tells Bob he's going on vacation for a few weeks, and this is not good news for Bob. It is not good news. It puts him in a panic. And through no small amount of deception, Bob finds out where Dr. Marvin is going to vacation. He gets on a bus and he goes there. And as Bob deboards the bus, Dr. Marvin is coming out of a grocery store, and he sees Bob, and then the doctor, bless his heart, he's trying to escape without being seen, but he has no such luck, because Bob ends up chasing him down the road. And so Dr. Marvin, he has to stop and confront Bob and say, hey, dude, this is not good. You've gone over the line here. And then Bob, he promptly falls to his knees, and in the, in the way that only Bill Murray can, he says, I need, I need, I need. I'm really working hard here. I'm really working hard here, and you guys are like, seriously. Believe it or not, actually, that's exactly what we're doing in our next petition of the Lord's Prayer. We are declaring that we are sons and daughters of the one true God who are in need. And we believe that he is the one who can help us. And so Jesus teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. So after all of the exalted language about God and his holiness and power, his rule, his kingly dominion, the Lord's prayer now admits our need. We need bread. We need bread. And in these words, we move from all-powerful God in heaven to us needy humans, which if we're honest, we really don't like to admit that, do we? We, we really don't. We don't want to think about those things. And, and we are taught to avoid such admissions by society, right? 
I mean, words like needy and hungry, they, they don't sit too well with us. We don't like that. I mean, they don't fit well with our societal ways of thinking and living that teach us to impress people, right? To make people think more of us than perhaps we really are. But friends, whether we like it or not, to be human is in no small part to be in need. And it is to recognize that we are not complete, we are not whole in and of ourselves. In fact, if you go back to humanity's origin story in Genesis chapter 2, we find this. The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So there's two Hebrew words here that are used. It's fascinating. Ruach and nefesh. Those are fun words. Ruach. You got to almost get a little bit of that in there, you know. Nefesh. And, And so after the Lord God shaped a body for the man, he breathed into the man's nostrils the breath of life. And our lives are sustained by God's breath. Ruach. So dust plus ruach equals human life. You're very welcome. I'm glad I could provide that help for you today. If we take away the breath, though, we return to dust. Yeah. The second Hebrew word here, it makes it even more interesting. When God breathed into us the ruach of life, we became a living nephesh. And nephesh, really, it, it's translated in a variety of ways, but some of the most common are soul, or being. And what's interesting is at the root of this word, uh, it's, it actually describes the part of the human body that we know as the neck or the throat. And so the neck of a human being is pretty fragile, isn't it? I mean, it's susceptible to injury that could paralyze you or even kill you. And the throat is the passageway which we receive everything we need for life, air, food, water, right? So from the very beginning, we discover that we are fragile creatures that are in need. When God breathed his breath of life into our nostrils, we literally became living thirsts, walking hungers, needy humans. So to pray, give us this day our daily bread, is to be deeply in touch with our essence, It is to declare that we as humans need our creator God. And this is truly for our good because, friends, we discover in our hunger, we have the opportunity to seek the one who is the only one who can truly fill us, our Heavenly Father. Bread, powerful symbol throughout the scriptures. It speaks to our need. And the scriptures contain several bread stories, but I wonder, however, as it relates to the Lord's Prayer, if we can find a more revealing bread story than the one that's found in the pages of the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 16. Now, let me give you a little bit of the backstory, okay? So long before the days of labor unions, the children of God were slaves in Egypt for 400 years, They're working 12 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. This is not good. Life is hard. It is not fun. It's all God's people know. What is Egypt, though? It's more than just a place on on a map. It's, it's more than just a destination. It, it's actually, for God's people, it was a symbol, if you will, of the scarcity that they were experiencing. It was a way of life that they were living in which they did not have enough. So the people of God, they had to basically scrap for what they could get while the Egyptians had more than enough. You see, nothing was coming to them as a gift. Toil, hardship, was their lot. And sometimes we're like, man, that feels kind of familiar, doesn't it? But as you may know, by way of plagues and the parting of the Red Sea, God delivered his people from the land of Egypt, and now they are moving through the wilderness toward the promised land. Behind them is an oppressive Pharaoh and a guarantee of scarcity. 
but what is it that lies before them? Well, in the moment, they have wide open wilderness, no signs of provision other than a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. This would be a daily journey of trust in the promise and the character of God, the one who called them out of bondage and had promised to lead them into a land flowing with milk and honey. So they set out. But as you know, after a while, reality kind of sets in, doesn't it, Gene? It does. They're stuck somewhere between Egypt and the promised land. They have no bread, no meat, no water. And there in the wilderness, they begin to doubt the character of the God who called them his kids. Have you ever been at a place in life where you wondered if the wilderness season settled at your address? You ever been there? You see, wilderness experiences, they oftentimes become very symbolic of any place that we find ourselves in with not enough, where we can't save ourselves, where we come face to face with our needs. And wilderness experiences, my friends, they've come in many forms and fashions. They carry a lot of different faces in life. Um, maybe you'll recognize some of these. Layoffs, rising inflation, fizzled finances, bodies that break down more than a 30-year-old Ford. That's pretty bad. Minds tortured by depression and anxiety, intimate relationships that seem destined for the dump, destructive choices or habits that are robbing you of your freedom and your future. And so what do the people of God do in their wilderness season? Do you remember what they did? They murmured. Now, to give you an idea of what this sounds like, everybody do this. That's such a lovely sound, isn't it? Such a lovely sound. That's what God's people did. They complained, right? They murmured against God. Can you hear them? The text tells us, Then they set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out of this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, you know, it's really easy for us to look at God's people at this point and say, you know, y'all got a really good case of selective memory, right? It's easy to look at them and say, man, what are you grumbling about? Don't you all remember the promise that God gave to you? I wonder if they might say the same thing about us sometimes. See, one of the things that we learn when we go through wilderness times in life is that it is possible to become so preoccupied with our present suffering that we forget how God has moved in our lives in the past. It's possible to complain and grumble about what we don't have instead of pausing to thank God for all of the blessings that we enjoy. It's possible for our eyes to become so fixed on our problems that we forget to trust in the character and the promises of our Heavenly Father. You know, blaming and complaining, that's one way to deal with our wilderness, with our neediness. But it will not transform our everyday lives into holy lives. You see, our Heavenly Father is just as concerned about getting Egypt out of us as he is about getting us out of Egypt. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. You see, he really is. God is just as concerned about getting Egypt out of us as he is about getting us out of Egypt. And, and friends, if we find our hunger for being filled, putting us in a state of mind that says that we would rather go back to Egypt we know that we're seeking fulfillment. We're seeking bread from the wrong source. 
back to our Israelite friends. Uh, our Father in heaven, he chooses to show them love, grace, and mercy. Something that will be a continual pattern that he will demonstrate to them time and time again. His supply for their need will come in the form of daily bread. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So God's mercy, God's love, his provision comes trickling down from heaven in the form of bread. And the people will ask, what is it? And literally, that is the Hebrew word for manna. It is. And that's what they called it. They called it manna. Now, these folks had always had to work for their bread. They had always had to scrounge, you see. They toiled, they labored. In their oppression, they bore the heavy load of slavery. But in this barren wilderness, God provides bread from heaven. It's a merciful gift of grace. You see, this is not Egypt, is it? This is not the future of the promised land. Where this happens is in the present. It's in the midst of their wilderness season where God richly and graciously provides for them. And friends, I want you to know he will provide for you as well. In those wilderness seasons that you face, God will show up. He'll meet your need. What a wonder. What a miracle. What a gift, you know. Daily bread is not given in scarcity. It is more than enough for the present, and there's more than enough to go around. But the children of Israel, they weren't used to that, were they? Now, they, they were used to having, basically most people having a little, some people having a lot, and then a little having none text tells us they did not listen to Moses and some left part of it until morning and it bred worms and became foul and Moses was angry with them they gathered it morning by morning every man as much as he should eat but when the sun grew hot it would melt so the scarcity mentality of Egypt was so deeply ingrained in them they actually began to hoard the bread right they were trying to stockpile it better than any doomsday prepper would Okay, And so in doing, because they were doing that, it became rotten. You see, here's the deal. You cannot keep God's generosity for yourself. His goodness, his blessing, and his grace, my friends, it's designed to be shared. So Moses told them to stop hoarding and to practice Sabbath. Gather manna six days and rest on the seventh. And what you gather on that sixth day, it's not going to spoil. It's going to carry you through day seven, and you don't have to go and pick more manna. Pharaoh would have never given them free bread, much less a day off. But God commanded it. It sounds to me like a heavenly father who knows the needs of his kids. Friends, when we live under Egypt's oppressive scarcity mindset, we will never have enough. Our minds will say we will never have enough. So what we'll end up doing is we will end up work, work, working, so we can collect more, 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 so that we can build bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger barns, so that we can convince ourselves that we can finally rest. It seems to me Jesus said something kind of like that. But we soon find that what we think is enough is never enough. And the rest from our fear, it never comes. You see, that's what Egypt does to us. It steals the breath of life from us. It robs us of our peace of mind. It robs us of our humanity true humanity. So can I remind us to whom we are praying when we pray the Lord's Prayer? 
our Father in heaven is not only the God who spoke the universe into existence, who formed and fashioned all of creation as we know it. He's not only the God who parted the Red Sea, but my friends, he is your Abba Father. (laughs) He loves you. He knows what you need. And he will supply. Look with me at the words of Jesus. Before this instruction to, for, to pray for daily bread, this is what Jesus says. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them. Why? For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Isn't that good news? Our Heavenly Father knows our need before we ask. He knows we're fragile. He knows we're frail. He knows that we're vulnerable, easily disturbed, and easy to become anxious. He knows we are in need, and He knows what we need. Now, let's look again at what Jesus has to say about our Father in Heaven, His knowing heart, and His ability and desire to meet those needs. Let's keep looking here. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. (sighs) But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So my friends, our Heavenly Father may not provide all of our greeds, but He has promised that if we will seek Him first, His kingdom, His righteousness, He will provide all that we need, every single thing. So when, when those oppressive taskmasters from Egypt come and assault your mind, when they try to convince you that there's not enough and there's not going to be enough to go around, that you're going to perish in your need, friends, remind yourself in those moments who your source of daily bread is. It's your Father in heaven. It's what a family in my church in Vancouver, Washington, they chose to do. They went through a wilderness season where they had to remind themselves that their Father in heaven would provide for their needs. John, um, his job, well, no easy way to say it, got laid off. He was the primary breadwinner for the family. So it kind of sent a shockwave throughout the family. And so the family, they immediately went to prayer, and and so did we as a church family. And, And... As a family with kids at home, a lack of health health insurance wouldn't be a good thing. So John and his wife, they did some hard work, and they were able to find some insurance for the gap period that they were in. And perhaps this is also a good point to stop and point out that when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, it doesn't mean that we don't have to take responsibility for our part, for our families, and for ourselves. See, though God was the source of the manna for the children of Israel, they still had to go out and collect it, didn't they? They had a part to play. Now, we know God is our source of daily bread. No doubt about it. 
But that being said, we'd be surprised how often God answers our prayers for bread by partnering with us as we take appropriate action and responsibility. I'll come back over to the rest of the story now. This was definitely the case for John and his family. After being let go from his job, John began to pray and ask for God's help and provision. And, and, and he also began to take action. He took responsibility for his family, for himself. He began reaching out to other people who were in similar positions as he was in and in other businesses. And, and he reached out to them. And, and God provided daily bread in a lot of different ways. An interview got scheduled. I talked with John and we prayed and we asked for God's blessing and favor as he went into the interview. We asked God to provide, and God did. John got the job, and in an amazing turn of events, that family never missed a paycheck. Absolutely a God thing. God provided their daily bread. He provided their need. My friends, we can trust our Heavenly Father to meet our needs. He has an endless supply of daily bread. We can rest in that. We can rest in our Father's knowledge of our needs. We can rest in the fact that He not only knows them, not only has the power to meet them, but He actually desires to. And that knowledge in and of itself can transform your heart and life in a powerful way so too can pray in the Lord's Prayer. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're not only connecting to the one who has the ability to meet our need for daily bread, but in relationship with him, we experience a love that can transform our anxiety into confidence, our emptiness into fullness, our concerns about scarcity into peaceful rest. Oh, that's good news. We find in our Heavenly Father one who wants to set us free from the bondage of fear. He's taken us out of Egypt. Now he wants to take Egypt out of us. Which I think really is just another way of saying the Lord's Prayer is a means of grace that can transform our everyday life into a holy 